Anchor. All right, because they don't, uh, one of the things about Telegram is they don't give you a, an actual recording of, they don't automatically record it. You have to find some other way to do that. So, um, now what we're going to do today is we're going to cover some, some really, some very basic things about starting a coaching business. And this is going to be geared more towards the person who really is, is not at a place yet where they're either just getting started or they're, they're seriously considering it. And they're saying to themselves, okay, like now's the time I really want to kind of understand what is the full, uh, the full understanding of kind of 50,000 foot view. Um, and what I would tell you is, is that there is, it, when it comes, when we start talking about this kind of stuff, it's like any one piece of this, we could actually break down a, into there, there's 10 or 15 or 20 levels that are underneath kind of the top level that we're going to go through. And, um, and so for those of you who maybe have a little experience with this or have already been running a coaching business, this is going to be less interesting to you, although you may get some benefit out of it because I, I run my coaching businesses a little bit different than teach you how to build them a little bit different. But for the most part, this is going to be for those people who are brand new because I have one of the big problems that I have. Well, let me say this first. Um, we are going to, how do I say this the best? Um, well, let's just do it like this. So let's say in any coaching business, one of the biggest questions is, well, how long is it going to take for me to, for me to be successful at this? How long is it going to take for me to, to actually start making money? I titled this thing, you know, the road to a hundred and, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, how to, how to, what is it? The anatomy of a hundred thousand dollar a year coaching business, right? Well, let's take that number a hundred thousand dollars and let's talk about, Hey, what does it actually take to, to do that? Right. And as near as I can tell with everybody that I have worked with, you are going to need to spend 18 to 24 months in diligent effort. And just so I'm clear that you guys, it does look right to you. It's done. Let's not flip backwards because it's flipped backwards on my end for some reason, but it, does that look okay to you guys? Yes, no, maybe. All right. I'm just going to go on and assume that it is. It looks fine. Okay. It's on the right side of the screen. The words are. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 18 to 24 months. Now that's not 18 to 24 months to you making a hundred thousand dollars a year in your coaching business. I, I think 18 to 24 months, a year and a half to two years is what it's going to take for you to start generating any sort of predictable income out of that business. And so that might be a thousand dollars a month. It might be $3,000 a month. But getting to that $8,000, $10,000 a month that everybody's kind of this magic number that everybody pitches you, that process is going to take you quite a bit of time. And there is no guarantee, right? And the disclaimer that I'll make to you guys is that, because uh, if I do talk about anything related to business or start showing numbers or talking about numbers uh, throughout this thing, I just want you guys to understand, I've been doing this 15 years, Right. Now you back that out. That means I got started in 2008, 2009 timeframe is when I really got into this so about 16 years now. Okay. That's almost at the very beginning of when online coaching became a thing. You can go back 2005. There were, you know, if you go back and take a look at guys uh, very early, early on, you're talking about the very early 2000s, maybe 2001, 2002, but this didn't really even become an industry until 2000, uh, let's, let's call it 2009, 2010, when it was just starting to, things were starting to happen. And so you're going to be hard pressed to find anybody else who teaches this stuff, who has been doing it longer than I have. Um, and I don't say that to brag. I say that as a disclaimer that says my results are not typical, right? What I have been able to do, what some of my clients have been able to do are not even on the same planet as typical. Right. And so don't assume that just because I'm showing you this, that I'm, I'm insinuating that there's some sort of uh, ability for you to do the same. The fact is, is I have found that it doesn't really matter. Most people are going to fail at this, right? We're probably talking about the 10 or the 20%. Let's just call it the 20% of people who start this process and who actually get to a point where they're able to generate consistent income with it. Now, if you ask me why that is, I think the major reason why it is, is because people just, they have an unreasonable expectation of how much time, effort, and energy it's going to take. Right. And that's why I want to do this at the beginning. Most people, and for some of you, I know some of you, I see Jeff in here are part of uh, my collective coaching group. 
and they're building out their programs right now and they're getting ready to start writing their sales page that they're going to use to sell their program with, right? Most people will never make it past the building out my program part because it's so much work and requires you to learn so many new skills in many cases um, that people end up getting stuck and it doesn't happen in a week like somebody promised you online and now you're two weeks or three weeks or a month or two months into building out the program that you're going to be using, hopefully to be able to generate hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and they just give up long before they ever get a chance to see. And keep in mind, that's before we do any marketing. That's before we try doing any sales. That's before we actually have to deliver on the program that we promise people and make sure that they're getting results and that the program's working right. That's before any of that. That's just literally put your, uh, your knowledge and your skill into a consumable format that will help people get a result, right? Most people don't even make it to that. And so if I could encourage you to do one thing is that if, if and when you are ready to get started, to just commit to six to 12 months of build time. This is just your build time, right? And then once we get from that six to 12 months and now we're into it for a year and we're starting to maybe get a little bit of traction and we're starting to see some people show some interest and we're building an audience of people who may want to do business with us in the future, then we can look at, okay, how do we really start driving revenue into this company? But most people just have such a such an improper expectation. And so I, I wanted to kind of start out with that and just clear that up so that you guys are walking into this with the right mindset um, and a willingness to do what's required in order to see the kind of results that you want. So um, now I covered this in a training that I did quickly uh, a week or so ago, uh, and, but I'm going to go over it again because I didn't record it. And so I know a lot of people haven't seen this. I like simple. I think that anytime you try and overcomplicate something, you're, you're going to ruin it, right? And especially in the beginning, when there is so much to learn and so many new things that you need to know, this, the simpler we can make the entire process and each step of that process, the better it's going to be for you and the more likely that you are, you're going to get results. So in any business, a coaching business specifically, there are three things that we have to have to be present, right? The first one is the program right? So that's like just what you're selling and what it is that you're offering in order to create transformation in someone's life. So the program is first. The second one is the offer, okay? And I'll explain how the offer and the program are different in just a minute. A lot of people think they're the same. They are not. And then last but not least is promotion, right? So we need something that gets a result for people. That's the program. We need an offer. That's a, that's what we're going to use to sell the program to someone and convince them to buy it. And then we need promotion or some way to promote the offer to people who have a reasonable chance of enrolling or pur purchasing from us, right? Now inside the program, and this is why I, how I make it easy for everybody to understand inside the program, there are three things. First one is the method. You'll hear me refer to this as, um, as the unique mechanism, because in most cases today, coaching business is not like it was 10, 15 years ago, where you can just slap together some videos and somebody will pay you a couple thousand bucks for it. There really needs to be some sort of unique mechanism, unique way you get results for clients. And this is one of the things that I spend a lot of time working with clients on is kind of developing what that unique mechanism looks like, right? But you need some sort of method to get results. The second thing you need are assets. And assets are those things that are going to help your clients get the result using your method. So assets might be videos, it might be PDF files, it might be software, it might be uh, spreadsheets, whatever it is that you're going to use to help them get the result that they want. That's what we need to include inside of the program. And then three is accountability. And this one is, I, I think accountability is what separates uh, what you would just consider to be a, what would be considered a, um, a, a course and then turns it into coaching. See, without the accountability or some way of, of following up and holding people's feet to the fire and just being that sort of accountability partner, you're not really a coach. You're just an information aggregator. You're just a person who's taken information, has condensed it down into some sort of course, and then you're just saying, here, good luck. And 
if we're going to run real coaching businesses, then there has to be some aspect of accountability, right? So then under the offer, right, the first thing that we're going to need is a promise. So what are they going to have, be able to do, feel, you know, what transformation are we going to kind of create in their lives? And that's, and we have to, we have to acknowledge that and we have to talk about that inside of the offer. So the first thing is a promise. Two is the product. Okay. So once we've made this big, bold claim, like I'm going to change your life or your life is going to, is going to be changed after this program. Now we have to show them how, and that's the product. And so, or, or the program in this case. So again, you'll see that the program, let's just make it easy. So the language is the same, right? Our program. And then number three is the proposition. What's the proposition? The proposition is just the terms that we're going to, the terms under which we will work together. All right. So the terms of what are the terms? Um, what is the guarantee? What's included? What's the time frame? When do I have to sign up by? Are there any bonuses? What else is it? All of that stuff goes into sort of the proposition. Once they understand the promise, they're, they're intrigued. They get the program and the walkthrough on that. Now, what are the actual terms and of how we're going to work together? Okay. And then last but not least, we have the, uh, the promotion. Okay. So what's in the promotion? The promotion consists of one, the offer. Okay. So again, got the offer. Two is messaging. So what are we going to say to people in order to get them to come look at our offer? So that might be a social media post. It might be an ad that a YouTube, a YouTube video pre-roll ad that you run. It might be a Google or a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad. So what is the messaging that we're going to send to people? And then finally, number three is the sequencing, right? So the sequencing means what is the order that the messaging comes in? Okay. Anybody got any questions on this before we move on? But this is it. Ultimately, what we are doing, we are in, um, we're in the, the transformation business, right? People are coming to you and they hire coaches because they have an urgent pain or problem that they either A, cannot solve on their own, or B, they realize that it would be too costly or time consuming to do it alone. And instead they want to hire you to help them with it, right? And so you can think about this. On one side of this, you have a person before they come to you who's not happy. And over here, so whatever the pain or the problem or the trouble is that they're having, they're over here in this state of discomfort. And over here is where they want to be. They want to be in this world where that pain, that problem no longer exists and isn't a factor. And your job, our job as coaches is to take them from that state to this one. And in order to do that, we have to have a program, right? We have to be able to show them what are all the steps involved with them getting from point A to point B. And we have to have an offer. So we have to have something that's really appealing, that makes sense financially and time commitment and uh, difficulty level, all those things. And then we also need a way to promote it. But that's it. At this core, that's all we're really talking about when we're building out our coaching business, okay? And so if we screw over here, this is kind of my formula for how I run my coaching business. And what you'll see is you've got kind of three levels in here and I'm just going to break them up like this. So over here where it says solution stack, guess what? This is your program, right? I recommend you start with a premium program. So wherever the high end of your market is, I suggest that you build that program first several reasons for that. The biggest one being is that in the beginning, you don't have a lot of followers. You don't have a lot of people who, you don't have a lot of brand developed yet. And so with very few followers and very little brand recognition, no, probably no results yet that you've gotten for people, at least not your paid clients, then what you're going to have to do is in order to make any real money, you're going to have to charge a premium price. So what a lot of people will do is they'll do it in reverse. They'll build out some cheap little $7 or $49 thing that they'll try and sell in order to kind of get their feet wet. And that's fine. 
But if you don't have a core product build or premium product at the high end, then you're never going to make any money because you, you, you're not going to be at a place early on where you're going to be able to sell 7,000, you know, $49 subscriptions or even, you know, probably even a hundred, right? So we've got to develop a program that is at the higher end of our market. And that's different for every market. Okay. So here's your program. We have our lead engine. So again, if we're taking a look at this, this is where our promotion comes in, right? So what are we doing to drive people into our business? Then in here, we have, this is our conversion incubator, right? And the conversion incubator is just, what do we do with people who aren't ready to buy right now? So let's say that we create a little, you know, something, get somebody to sign up for, say, a PDF or a training video that we put out, or maybe it's something like this, where I say, hey, join our community, and I'm going to teach you a class on how to build your first coaching business and how to build it, kind of give you a blueprint for the first, to getting to $100,000 a year, right? Well, in order to get this training, they have to sign up and become a member of our community, and I get an email address for that, okay? So when they build that thing out, terrific. Now we've got an email address and now I can start promoting. But what if there are people who don't immediately want to buy something from me, which is going to be most people? What do we do with those folks? Well, we have to put them into a process of continuing to nurture and promote and to build trust, build uh, uh, reliability, build value in their audience until they're ready to buy. And this is what I call the conversion incubator. Okay. So what the, pro the way the process works is we first develop some sort of lead magnet, some sort of offer for people. It could be a quiz. It could be a, a video training. It could be a report. There are a thousand different things that we can use to offer to people and to say, hey, if you will give me your email address, then I will send you this thing of high value. Okay. And when we get leads... What a lot of people don't realize is about 50% of those leads, these are going to be never buyers, okay? So these are people who will never buy anything from you no matter what. And that's about 50, can be higher than that, could be 60%. But in my experience, about 50% of people will never buy anything. Up here in this blue area, this is probably 35%, maybe 45%. These folks are the later buyers, and these are folks who, yeah, at some point in the future, maybe it's in 90 days or six months or a year, we're going to have enough, they're going to have enough confidence and they're going to be ready to go ahead and take the plunge and buy something from you. And then right here at the very top, this is like your 15%, five to 15%. These are your now buyers. And your now buyers, it's real easy. Just send them over, say, here's the program. Okay. Here's how much it costs. Here's the, here's all the proposition of everything that's included and you can go and get it and they'll buy. Everybody else who comes into our funnel and into our lead engine, we're just going to put them into our conversion incubator. For me, this is email. So I use email to communicate once somebody has signed up and they're on my email list. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how I do this and this entire process here in just a minute. So stick with me if you don't understand this. We're going to go into more detail on how this actually gets done in just a second. But eventually, a couple of things will happen. Eventually, some of these people will end up, the later buyers will end up coming and buying the program. And then some other people, they'll end up buying smaller stuff. And so one of the ways that I teach people how to build coaching businesses is to build what are called solution stacks rather than courses. And so solution stacks solve specific problems and they can be learned independent of each other. And so when you design your, like your premium program this way, what you can do is you can break out these individual trainings and you can sell them independently to your list. And they're not going to be clients. They're really going to be more of customers because they're going to buy maybe a workshop from you or some training that you did for your, you know, for your clients six months ago. But it's still of high value to them. And it's a way for you to generate extra income inside of your, inside of your coaching business that doesn't require you to constantly be creating brand new courses to sell all the time and running big product launches, all stuff that I absolutely hate doing. But this is the general structure of how I run the coaching business. Any questions on that? Okay. Something quick, Jason. Yeah. Uh, can you speak about the difference between assets and solution stacks? Are they the same? 
help me differentiate those two items in this graphic. Yeah, that's a good question. So when we think of the program that you're going to develop for people, the way most people think about it is they think about it in, 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 a, in a linear mindset where I've got a series of, okay, in training one, I've got to show them how to do X. And then in training two, I got to show them how to do Y. And it sort of builds on itself until you have a whole program. So to make this more relevant to you, what is the coaching business that you're either thinking about or that you're currently involved in? Use of oh, technology to... sorry, Jeff. I thought you were so, thought you were somebody else. Uh, my bad. I I got it. No, same Jeff. Yep. Sorry, dude. No, I'm with you now. No, I know. I know you now. Okay. So for you, yeah. No, no, no. It's it's fine. So for you, the way I would look at it is, is I would say, okay, what are the different problems that I'm solving for sales managers, right? So one of them might be getting bids out faster. One of them might be um, better communication along the sales pipeline or the chain, right? Um, you can probably come up with four or five different ones, right? Now, traditionally, the way you would build out a, a course or a coaching program was to be create a course. And that course would teach every single one of those, but would teach them in starting at one and going to five. And then you would force everybody to kind of go through the same process. What I mean by thinking about it in terms of, of solution stacks rather than like a traditional course is I want to be able to I want to be able to pull somebody out and have them start anywhere in the process based on what they're struggling with, okay, or what the biggest need is for their company. And so I'll give you a for example with our collective uh, coaching group. Um, just brought on a new member. Uh, and they were talking and they already have a business put together. They're already doing a, a decent amount of revenue out of that business. And I was talking through with them and I said, well, okay, well, if you come into the program, you've got all these other people who are all at, going at the same pace. But I said, you're not going to start at the beginning. We'll just have you start where we're building out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the assets, promotional assets. So building lead magnets, building follow-up sequences, because that's where he's at in his process. And what I want to develop and the kind of how I've differentiated from uh, some of the other coaching programs that are out there is I don't really care where you're starting. I can plug you in at any stage of the process. And that's a little different than a traditional course where I would just say, okay, I don't know anything about you. Here's the course, go and watch these videos. Um, it makes it even worse if you kind of, if you, if you're, if you're dripping the content out so they can't even get to what they really need for two or three months, that's, that's even worse. Now, when you think about assets, what, what we're talking about is, okay, inside of the solutions that you offer, so those four or five things that you can solve for, what assets do you need in order to teach that? So do you need PowerPoint presentations? Do you need video training? Do you need uh, to have question and answer where people are coming in? Um, are, are there going to be other resources like, uh, like, a, like help resource sections or PDFs that walk them through the process, give them links to stuff? Um, what are those assets? So one of the things that I created for you guys that I'm actually going to be giving to uh, everybody else who's here today just because I thought it would be valuable is, um, let me see here, share screen, is this tool of the trade document, right? So this is an asset. So when I'm talking to you about what you're going to need to build out your coaching business and to build out the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the video and the audio and the PDS, it's helpful that you have some links to stuff that will be help that will be valuable. Like how do I do record my video? What are the best video solutions? Because there's a ton of them out there. How do you know which ones to go with? What about video cameras? Do I need to have one or not? So I, I kind of put this together as an asset inside the program that would make it easy for me to update. So rather than doing a video, I think in the video training I have associated with this, so one of the problems that I had in my, in my business was I would do a video on all of the best stuff and then in three months, there'd be something better. And so now, oh man, do I go re-record that video every time? It's like, no, let's put together a PDF doc, a Google doc that I can keep updated. So when somebody comes to the program in six months, it's still there. So does that make sense on, on kind of the hierarchy of how, how you think about this? Or are you still confused? Well, here's, here's what I'm 
hearing. Assets are individual components inside of the solution set. A hundred percent. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I probably could have said it in less words now that you now that you've framed it up like that, but hopefully they, hopefully that you're welcome. <laughs> right. All right. So now let's talk about, uh, now that we've kind of got this stuff put together and you understand a little bit about the, the three components of the coaching business as I have them put together, let's take a look at some truths about the way that we, that people buy things. You know, traditionally you might think of the funnel where, you know, you go out and you get somebody some information, then they sign up for your thing and then pretty soon they and they buy something from you, right? That's not really the way it works. That's not how we buy things online. If we always start in the beginning, um, we always start with awareness, right? So it all starts here, getting someone's attention, if you want to think of it that way. But once you've got somebody's attention and they have a, a wee bit of interest in what you do and, and who you serve and the problems that you solve for, they enter into a consideration phase and what's called the research and discovery loop here. And this is where they're going out online and they're looking at you and they're researching you and they're seeing what other people are saying about you and asking, does he have a YouTube channel? Does he have a Facebook or an Instagram account? Facebook isn't nearly as relevant anymore, but they have an Instagram account, right? Like, is this person real? And what they're really saying is, do, can I trust this person? Like, can I trust their advice? Can I trust that, do I, can I put my faith in them that they can help me solve this pain or this problem? And this research and discovery loop can take a very long time. As I said, even after they've signed up for your lead magnet and they've taken, uh, kind of taken the first step in learning from you and, and gaining some extra knowledge and wisdom from you, even after that phase, it may take a year before they ever end up buying anything from you. That's why this phase in here, hang on, let me just delete some of this. That's why um, this conversion incubator phase, this consideration phase right in here, this is something that we gotta pay really close attention to. Because if we don't do this, this is where the money is made, by the way, in any coaching business. It's not made here right? When somebody signs up and, and even if they pay you something in the beginning, it's actually made in the consideration phase and the conversion incubator side of things, okay? But that can take up to a year, in some cases more than that. And so you've just got to ride that out and you've got to have enough content and enough information value that you're delivering on a daily, a weekly basis that eventually they get to a point where they decide they want to buy something from you. And then after they buy something, there's an entire other process that we're not even gonna talk about today, which is the post-purchase experience. It's the loyalty loop. It's how do we now get them to purchase again or to continue to stay invested or enrolled in the program? How do we get them to start promoting and becoming advocates of ours and, and being people who are out there talking about us, getting people who will defend us if, uh, if someone is talking trash about us? You know, how, do we, how do we develop and nurture that post-purchase relationship as well? So it's important to understand the way we buy in the modern buyer's journey because it's going to make understanding the steps that we have to do uh, and why they're important. And so I would say, for example, that a lot of people don't like social media. I, I, would, I agree. I would not be on social media if it wasn't part of a be, having a presence and being known. Um, if you don't like that, you can use something like YouTube. YouTube is a little bit different. Yes, there are comments, but it's not really a social media platform. It's more of a uh, it, it's more of a content distribution or a learning platform. Um, it's also where a big chunk of your audience, if you're in a coaching business, are going to be found because it's people who are going there specifically to learn information, to learn skill, or to you know to solve problems. And so, if you want to be if you if you if you don't like social media, you can still be on YouTube. You can even shut off the comments if you want if, it, if that bothers you. Um, but you have to have some sort of presence. People say, well, why do we have websites? Well, in my mind, we have a website so we can direct them to all the other places where they can find information about us. So where's my YouTube channel? Where's my social media? Where are the interviews that I've done with other people? Where are the collaborations that I've done? How do people find out about my products or the other things that I have? That's the, what a, a website is really, that's what a website does. There's very little direct conversion um, from sales on a website. 
What I mean by that is, if you go to my website, and I track all of this, so you guys know, you can come to current offers, all right? So we got the new Coaches Guild. That's what you guys are in right now. We've got Leverage Coach, The Collective, which are the two uh, coaching programs that I run. I have a free, I have a, a paid training here on the email income crash course, which was a, a, one of the one of the highest rated trainings that were like workshops that I did. And then I got a bunch of other free stuff in here, a book, a little free training on how to write a good offer and some stuff on entrepreneurial minimalism, which is a concept that I, I believe in. I can tell you, no one buys off of this. This is here for them to poke around. I do get some people who sign up for like Nomadic Wealth Formula and for the, the entrepreneurial minim minimalism training. Um, and occasionally I do get some people signing up for the DNA offer on here as well, but no paid stuff. Okay, so the paid stuff is there just to show people that I do have stuff and that it is available. Where does all of the money get made? It all gets made through email because it's going to take that sort of time developing the relationship. No one's just going to see your stuff online on X and then jump over to your, uh, your website and then start buying stuff from you. What we hope to do is we hope to create some engaging content that will get them to want to take a lead magnet from us. Now, what's a lead magnet? Looks like this. This is a very simple funnel that goes from uh, social media to an opt-in page, a thank you page, and then a series of emails, and then, you know, to an offer or an order, okay? Now, what I will tell you is you don't technically even need this part, okay? So if all you, if all you do is just focus on this, you're good. This over here, this here part here is gravy, but I'll show it to you in total so that you have a context of how it works. So we're going to start off again with just some sort of social media content. As I said, it could be YouTube, could be LinkedIn, anywhere, could be a blog. I mean, if you're on, if you, maybe you spend a lot of time on Reddit and you're a really active poster on Reddit and you've got a big following there. It's just where are you developing your following of people who already have a level of trust with you. And then from there, inside that content, you're gonna say something like, hey, go check out this free thing that I have. So in mine, if you were to go to, just to show you how this works in principle. So if you were to come here to X and you went to my profile, it's gonna say, hey, join our free Telegram group for coaches and consultants. If you click on that link, it's gonna take you to this page. All of you were on this page at one time and signed up for this. Just gives them a little bit about the benefits of joining and what it is, and then gives them an image so it's like not that scary. It's like, oh yeah, it's a chat, chat room. And then first name and email address, and then you click join, okay? That's all this is, okay? I, they, they checked me out on social media. They came on in, they took a look at the, the Coaches Guild, they liked it, they signed up, took them to a thank you page, and we're done. Now I have an email address, and I also have somebody, hopefully, who's also taken the extra step and joined the community, so now I have two different ways to communicate with them, right? Now what happens after that is sometimes you will see a series of emails that are built out. These are called email sequences. That are, that are put together immediately after someone signs up. So after they go to the thank you page, they're gonna get an email and it's gonna say, hey, if you like this free thing that I did, then you're really gonna like my paid thing. And you should go check out my paid thing. And so the guy comes from the email and he comes in here and he looks at the offer and he says, ah, you know what? I don't, I don't really want that thing right now. And then a day or two later, they get another email. It says, hey, here's another reason why you should have this thing. Go check it out. Eh, I don't really think I want that. Then we come here and we're going to try again. We're going to try three or four times, same process, until eventually either they buy the thing that we're offering them or they don't. Okay? But this is the overall process of the lead engine, of this process right here, of driving someone 
from social media or what I would say from, from um, distribution points you do not control to ones that you do. So you do not control Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. You don't control their algorithm. You don't even have ownership of your audience. That belongs to YouTube. They might be subscribed to your channel, but YouTube could shut your channel off tomorrow and you will lose access to that entire audience. That is not your audience. That is YouTube's audience. An email list that you control is something that you have access to and that nobody else can shut off. If you're like me, you back up the email list every 90 days or so, and so you have a hard copy of it. So even if the email uh, provider decides they don't want to allow you to have access to your list anymore, you still have it. And the cool thing about email lists is, is that even if a provider says, we will no longer allow you to email through us, because I've seen it happen before, they will always allow you to download your email list. They will not prevent you from taking what is yours. They will just tell you, look, you can't send emails through us anymore. And so that's a really nice thing. And so a big part of our marketing is just taking people from distribution channels we don't control and getting them onto an email list uh, or something like that, that we do control. Even this Telegram group, like, listen, the reason I don't send people a direct link to go sign up for the Telegram group is I don't get an email address. And if I don't get an email address, then this is no better than having a big YouTube following or a big Facebook following right? They could change the rules on me anytime. And so we have to filter people through that email gate. And when I get into teaching how to do this, there are some things that tend to work better as lead magnets in terms of getting a quality lead email address and things that don't. So I'll give you a for example. Um, what I have found to be one of the most effective lead magnets at getting an accurate email address um, are newsletters, especially my newsletter where I tell them I'm going to email you every day. I learned this from a guy named Ben Settle, who if you guys, he's a copywriter, um, just a belligerent dude, but absolutely love his copy and, and love his mindset stuff. So um, worth a follow if you're interested in that. But one of the things Ben does before you sign up for his email address is he says, I'm going to email you every day, sometimes multiple times a day, and I'm going to try and sell you something in every email. He says, if you are not interested in that, then do not sign up for my stuff. Now, he is a copywriter who sells copywriting stuff, so a lot of people like being sold in those. But that's a newsletter people would want to be sold in, right? My group, most are not that good. So most of them don't want to be sold all the time. But what I do tell them is I'm going to be emailing you daily and or sometimes multiple times a day. And I'm going to be trying to help you fix these kinds of problems. But you just need to understand if you don't want to get email from me every day, don't sign up. And so I tend to get a really high quality lead from that. Now I get fewer of them. I don't get nearly as many as if I had some sort of fancy piece of software or some secret system that I was going to show people. But what tends to happen when we have that kind of stuff, download my report, download this other thing, is what happens. You, they, so everybody's got three or four email addresses. They send you to the junk one. They go and get your free thing so they can see it. And then they either immediately unsubscribe or you stay on some tertiary email address that they never check. Okay. We want to try and find people who have a high likelihood of actually wanting to get in conversation with us. And that's where these types of things, um, this process becomes really important is that, hey, I actually don't do this part right away. So I don't immediately try and sell people something. What I do is I spend a few emails trying to get them to respond to me. I try and get them to, so I'll send them a note and I'll be like, hey, thanks for signing up. Like, do you, are, do you ever run a full-time coaching business or are you, uh, are you just starting out? And I try and get them to reply. And then I'll say, hey, um, well, yeah, if, the, if I can get somebody in a conversation with me, which is normally about 5% or 10% of the people who sign up, is I'll say, hey, what type of coaching do you do? And what's the biggest struggle right now? I might have some free stuff uh, in, in my solution stack that I can just give you. So what's the biggest pain problem? And I'm just trying to get a conversation started with them. And if they respond and they say, hey, here's what I'm really struggling with, and I have some training, I'll just send it to them. I'll be like, hey, yeah, absolutely. Hey, go watch this video that I did, or go watch this little mini training that I put together um, that, uh, that's going to help you with that. And then let me know if you got any questions. All I want to do is just build that trust 
let them know that, hey, when they get an email from me, it's going to be worth reading and that I have a genuine interest in trying to help them become more successful and to build a quality coaching business, right? But that's the pro that's that process. But now what happens if you send them a few emails or maybe even try and sell them something and nothing happens? You don't hear crickets from them. Well, what happens now is we end up moving them into the conversion incubator. And we're going to send them... I recommend at least three emails a week. Uh, I do five or more, but a lot of people that really stresses them out. And especially if you haven't done a lot of writing, um, it can be overwhelming to try and come up with stuff to write about every single day. But if you start out with two to three emails a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the best days to mail. Then you can start building a little bit of consistency and people are going to get used to seeing your name and, 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 and reading what you write and seeing the sort of offers that you have out. And one of two things is going to happen. Well, one of three things is going to happen. All right. When you do these, they're either, let me get a better color here. One, no response. Okay. They, maybe they didn't open it. Maybe they opened it but they didn't click on anything. They really just are consumers or they're just ignoring what you put out. So they get no response from them. Number two is they unsubscribe. Good grief if I could write. They unsubscribe and you'll see a lot of this. Bunch of people will just straight up unsubscribe from your emails if you start hitting them with two, three emails a day. That's fine. They're not, they're not ready. They're not in a position where they have a pain or a problem that is big enough that they're going to, that they're going to pay for your services. Remember people don't buy coaching when it's offered to them. They buy it when they have an urgent need that they need help solving. And so if they're not signing up for your list at exactly the moment when that urgent need is there, they're not going to be a buyer. Now it may take, they may be, their pain may be 90 days out, right? So depending on your industry, an urgent need may be one that needs to get solved by the end of next quarter, right? But what I'm getting at is if you got somebody who's just signed up because they were a looky-loo, a tire kicker, a dabbler, and now they're getting three emails a day from you and they're like, this is too much. Like, I don't really, I don't care about, I don't care enough about this to hear every single day from this person. Great. Let them unsubscribe. They're not a good candidate for you right now. And guess what? When the time comes, if you stay active and you continue to promote yourself and they stay following you on social media, there's a really good chance when that need does become urgent that they will come back on the list and they'll be a lot more interested in hearing from you on a regular basis. Okay. Now, the third thing that they'll do is they'll respond. Now, they might respond by replying to your email and telling you how much it meant to them or, or a, a similar story that they might have of their own lives. It might be a response of clicking on a link to go look at an offer that you have. It might be signing up for something additional like a workshop or something that you're running, or it could be buying a product or a service, but they're going to do some sort of response. The ones that we care about a lot are the response ones, especially if they're emailing us and telling us uh, how much they like our emails or how much, uh, you know, or how um, a, a story that's relevant or related to something that we were emailing about. Now, in order to accomplish this and to be able to mail three to five times a day, you cannot, or three to five times a week, you cannot just be sending them like buy my stuff emails, like doors closing, all of that, that nightmare stuff that everybody hates. Um, last call, doors open again, doors closed again. It's, it's absolutely, nothing will, it will terminate an email list faster if that's all you send is just pure buy my stuff emails. So we got to mix it up a little bit. We need to be, the purpose of the conversion incubator is to build trust and credibility and authority with the people who are on your list so that they will feel comfortable coming and doing business with you. And I do this in three ways with three types of, well, four types of emails, really kind of three. The first is bonding. So bonding emails are nothing but pretty much story. Might be a story about when I was a kid, might be about when I went to the grocery store the other day and I was looking for dried raspberries and I couldn't find them anywhere. 
and I'm walking around the store like an idiot, but I got too much pride to ask somebody who works there where it is because I'm sure I could find it. I don't want to text my wife who would instantly know and would be able to tell me. Of course, I don't do any of that because I'm, I'm an idiot. Uh, I'm too proud <laughs> to go and do that. And so it might be a story about that. Um, very rarely will you see me talk about and tell stories about lavish lifestyle type things. So I travel a lot. We tend to stay at really nice places. You know, we, I, I went to Portugal last year. I did talk a little bit about that, but a lot of the stuff that I do, um, in terms of higher end lifestyle stuff, I don't share a lot of that. And the reason is twofold. Number one, I don't want to attract people who are like hustle porn type of people. And that's what they're looking for is they're looking for somebody who's living the life and going to show you how to, how you could be rich and famous too. I, I hate that about our industry. Um, and that tends to attract a lot of people with no money and absolutely no commitment. I want somebody a little different than that. And so I don't do that. And the second reason I don't do it is because it's not relatable, right? If I, if I tell you about, you know, if I tell you about a private plane flight that we took to go to Northern California to, or to wine country and that we stayed at this gorgeous like five and a half star, whatever it is, resort and went on all these wine tours, you know, it, that's unrelatable to most people. Okay. What is relatable is going to the grocery store and having too much pride to text your wife when you can't find the dried cranberries after 10 minutes of pacing back and forth down the aisles, right? And so bonding emails are emails that are just designed to connect with the audience. Next, you've got teaching emails. This is what people, a lot of, a lot of people think that this translates to value. Oh, I'm going to teach you something. This equals value. This can also equal value. Okay. This when done correctly could also signal value, right? But certainly every one of these in some way has to deliver value, has to be either entertaining or informative or some combination of the two, or nobody's going to come work with you. Okay. And nobody's going to read your stuff. They're just going to unsubscribe. And so the teaching emails, the third of the selling emails, I, I do almost no direct selling emails. Normally what I will do is this, I'll do some sort of hybrid. So I might do a little bit of teaching and I'll also sell right? I could do a, a little bond. I might tell a little story that aligns with the, pro with the prospect, with my audience, and then also tell them or remind them about this thing that I've got going on that you can sign up for. Um, some sort of hybrid. This is where all 90% of my, my, my email communications are. It's some combination of bonding and teaching or bonding and selling, some combination of that. But the idea behind this is, again, if we go back to our program here, and we just zoom in here on the lead engine, right? What do we know about the lead engine? We know that 50% are never buyers, 35 are here, and probably five are here, give or take, right? The math doesn't entirely make, make sense, but you get the idea. We're focused on this. This is where all the money is. This chunk right here of people who are going to buy at some point, but who just need a little bit more in terms of, in terms of information and, and trust before they can make that commitment. And so we create a way to do that using email, but doing it in a way that gets people excited about seeing your stuff and going like, oh, what's he gonna teach me today? Or what kind of story is he gonna have today? What concept or elevated thinking am I going to have now that I get done reading what this person has wrote? It's not, a, it's not a, it's not a complicated thing to do, but it certainly isn't easy. Trying to come up with something that will entertain and elevate your audience every time you send out an email, especially when you're doing it five days a week, um, can be taxing but it's something that we have to do in order to build the trust, the credibility and the authority that we need to get somebody to buy from us. Questions about any of this? Do you, do you utilize AI for any of your email campaigns? No. Well, let me, no, not in the way that you think. So I have chat GPT open 
if I can't think of a phrase or a word, or if I'm trying to, because uh, ChatGPT now is connected to the internet, so I can actually, I can ask it for information on the internet. Uh, and so I'll use it almost like a Google search. Um, I'm like, hey, what's another word that means this? Because if I just can't think of it and the, 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 the online thesaurus isn't giving me what I'm looking for, I can ask it for that. What I don't do is I never ask it to write me an email or to use these bullet points and turn it into an email. Um, I, I don't do any of that. I, I think that is, that's going to be one of the big problems with content creation moving forward. It's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm teaching this uh, influential writers intensive next month. Uh, we're going to spend a month actually learning how to write to influence. And reason being is because we are really drowning in low grade information right now. That's all being created by chat bots and chat GPT and, and, and people think, and they're being sold this idea that, Oh, I don't actually have to think about any of this. I can just tell chat, chat, chat GPT what I want to create a course about, and then it'll spit out a course with all the bullet points. And then all I got to do is just go and record some videos. Um, or worse yet, I'm going to use AI to create like mountains and mountains of content so that I don't have to spend any time actually thinking for myself. Uh, the actual the actual skill of thinking is becoming something in very short supply, especially in the coaching space. Finding something and someone who will truly elevate your thinking and will who has, truly has the power to shift your perspective and to move you off of the X of where you currently sit into some other area where now you think differently or you feel differently or you have new understanding that wasn't there before. That's, I think it's always been in such rare supply. The problem is now you've got so many people who are claiming to be thought leaders who really couldn't think their way out of a wet paper bag. And so I don't want to use AI for any of that, but I will use it like perplexity. I'll use perplexity to go and search the internet to find, to do Google search stuff that is a lot easier with perplexity now than just doing traditional Google searches. But that's really the extent that I use AI at all. Is that good? Any other questions on that? Any other questions at all? That was great. Okay, cool. I, I was impressed with how fast you picked up with one of the other groups. That you've just used points like Aspen. Did you use AI to write this? And I was, it kind of shook me that, wow, you can't, it, the shortcuts are obvious to somebody that knows what they're looking for. Oh, it's painfully obvious. And, and AI will get better, okay? Um, but what AI can't do is it can't create. For all of the talk about AI, AI is not creative. If it gets to a point where it's actually creative, um, then we, there might be some use to having it and having it as a partner in your, in your creative collaboration, right? But right now, it can't create. What it will do is if you feed it the same set of inputs, it will always give you the exact same response in the exact same way, right? So it is it has been trained on information. And when you assemble the information in a specific way and deliver it to the AI, it will spit out a response to you and it will spit out the same response every time. Now, if you go from one AI to another, that may, it may modify or shift a little bit. But what that tells us is the AI isn't actually creative. It's not engaged in, in taking separate ideas because what is creativity? It, it's really taking two seemingly unconnected principles or ideas and creating something new out of it, right? Um, it, could, it could be a new painting. It could be a new bit of music. It could be um, a, a new way of thinking that hasn't been used before. But there's something new that comes out of these two seemingly unconnected concepts or ideas. That is something that artificial intelligence can't do. And so, and it hasn't quite figured out how humans talk either. So even when you're reading it, you're reading, if it, a lot of it reads like, uh, oh, it re I always say it looks like it reads like it was written by a committee, right? So there's all of these, oh, what word should we use there? Well, we can't call it that. Let's call it this. And when you read it, it just looks like a team of five people, you know, went over this 15 different times before they spit it out. And people, real people don't talk that way. 
And so anytime you start reading artificial intelligence, it's pretty easy, at least at this point, to be able to pick up on it. And that may change. And my, my opinions may change about it in the future if it becomes more of a co-collaborator and it can actually do some sort of creative expression. Um, I can think of nothing better in my life than having a second me. Something that I could literally plug everything I learn into and have it watch everything I've ever produced in terms of video and audio content and then have it then act as, as a, almost like a personal assistant or as someone who can assist me in spitballing ideas and coming up with creative stuff and, and to be that creative partner. We're a long, long way away from that. And, and I think we have kind of, at least for the time being, reached peak AI. Um, for a lot of different reasons that I won't go into today, but I, I think there's very little chance that we see any sort of like, like exponential growth in artificial intelligence. I, I think what we'll continue to see is kind of this little incremental growth as, as things begin to, as things continue to evolve. Um, I might be eating my words on that, but I'm not usually wrong about this stuff. So just in looking at the market, I, I think, I think we've got, we've kind of hit the pinnacle, at least for the time being. Um, any other questions? All right, we're coming up on it. Oh yeah, no, I, you know what, what I can, what I do is I don't even, so what I will do is if I'm going to say create, well, what do you mean by AI in video? Because there are lots of, there's lots of stuff in um, like DaVinci Resolve that is, has AI in it to help with facial tracking and color grading and, um, and accessing, or I guess, keying in on different parts of the video. I use that all the time. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about something different? No, no. And, and I use some of that stuff for the video editing things that I do as well. We are familiar with that. There are uh, AI video generation tools out there now that can take your concept and can give it a script or give it some parameters. And it will pull clips and videos and stills and things like that off of the internet. It will narrate, it will subtitle, and it will produce something out of, out of whole cloth. And I'm actually I'm experimenting with placeholders on my website right now to, to kind of take some of the more difficult to conceptualize concepts of, of, of smartphones and making them as a, as a lead magnet or a teaser. Yeah, no, I'm, I would have to see it. The ones I have seen where they're using AI, like AI voice and AI, um, you know, 100% AI generated content is that it has that it has that same dead feel to it. Right, like you know how when you, you, you there's just no soul to the content when you watch it, and, and that's kind of the way I when I look at that stuff, it's like okay, the information may be relevant, and the graphics may be good, but I don't walk away feeling like it was like it was creative. It was more like just reading, like getting a textbook with some graphics, and that's fine. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff, but when we create content, if we want to build, what we're trying to do with content is we're trying to build credibility, authority, and trust. You cannot ask someone to trust you and follow you and give you money if what you're producing isn't your own. It's produced by artificial intelligence. Um, and even if the words are your own and it's artificial intelligence that is the face of it, uh, it's very difficult for you to create the kind of connection that you need with someone using that type of content. Um, now, where it might be really relevant and valuable is in actually maybe teaching some functionality. So once they've already gained a little bit of trust and now you're teaching content, be like, okay, here's a video on how to do this simple task. So rather than going reading, like when you're a coder, coders learn to read a lot, right? They're constantly reading how to do stuff. And I, I hated that, right? I just wanted somebody to give me a video and show me how to do it. So it could be that that's an alternative for you when you're teaching a process inside the phone is to actually have AI help you generate a video that might be useful. I'd be really interested to see what you're creating because it might be really cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll send you a link after okay. I'll DM it to you. Yeah, send it over to me or bring it, uh, bring it on Wednesday to our training because uh, we, uh, we got collective training this week too, so we can take a look at it there as well. But that'll be really interesting to see. I, 
I have not spent a lot of time working with on that and, and you know, on the creative side of that using those tools, mainly because I tried a few of them. I don't know if it's been your experience too, but I've tried a few of those. And what I find is that the hype is way better than the product itself. And when I get in there, it actually doesn't do nearly as well and doesn't function nearly as well as it was, as it was, it was promoted. And then they all want like, Forty, fifty dollars to a to two hundred dollars a month to use their AI thing, which, I mean, frankly, I've gotten good enough at creating content that I can just create it myself faster. I, the grit and stuff, I couldn't use it to write a chapter or write a book or anything. I, I think at this point I've worked with it enough that I would have the same reaction if I saw it, and I somebody's presenting content to me in an email or on a website. I would know that it was AI generated and it would damage credibility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The volume of content you're talking about in this workshop or this uh, this telegram seems daunting to a guy like me. Well, I, how, I, I struggle to produce that much content three times a week in an email. Sounds exhausting to me. It, it, and it probably is in the beginning. So for me to write the my email co content now, I can get 500 words out. My emails are my emails are longer, so they're between 300 and 500 words. Um, I can crank one of those out in 20 minutes, right? Um, and I just keep a log. So when I teach this, the way I teach it is, hey, you're going to come up with ideas at weird times. Just create, open up your Apple Notes or whatever you use to kind of collect your ideas and just write them down, write down ideas on things you can talk about. And what ends up happening is over weeks and months is you've got this like big list of stuff. And now you can kind of go back and pull from it when you're struggling to find something to write about. Uh, what I don't want is I don't want anybody feeling like there's all this I have to do. So like it's, it's relatively simple what we do. It's just not easy. So the last thing that you wanted, what I would tell you is instead of trying to go and get AI to help you backfill with the, with the work that you're doing because you don't think there's going to be enough time, reduce the amount that you're creating. I would rather see you creating one, one email a week to your list um, and making it you in your voice and building that bond and connection than three a week and two of them are AI created or AI you know, assisted. You'll, get, you'll do better with the one. Okay. Right on. Okay. Any, anybody else got any other questions before I kind of move on? We're already at over an hour here. I don't want to keep you guys forever. Um, but I do want to answer any of your questions and just kind of give you guys this kind of roll, kind of bundle this up. So it's easy for you guys to have a takeaway. Okay. So if we come back and we look at this, it's pretty simple, right? Like I said, it's simple. It's just not easy. His step number one is we have to know what is it that we're creating? What problem are we solving? And when we start with the big problem, the premium problem that our audience has, it makes it easier for us to message. And once we know what our problem is that we solve for, the method that when we come back here, we look at this, when we, when we understand the method and the assets and we have the accountability and we have that program created, then the question is, um, now we can message and now we can create some lead magnets and some offers to people that offer, you know, help in advance by teaching them something or helping them solve a problem to get them onto our email list. And once they're on the email list, we're just going to talk to them and we're going to continue to talk with them. And as the email list grows, things get better and more people will come and buy the product. And we create, as our, as our program grows, we'll have more assets that we can sell, Right that we can sell back to our list. And all we do is just do more, right? So if in the beginning you're getting 10 leads a week, right? And you get to a point where now you're starting to make a little bit of money. Maybe you got a thousand people on the email list and that thousand uh, that email list is making you, um, well, a good number for that is around one dollar, well, just call it, just call it a dollar. Let's say after, you know, after you take out your, uh, your overhead, let's just say if you're making one dollar per subscriber 
per month on your email list, you're doing pretty good. So that means if you've got a thousand people on your email list, then a pretty good number for you to be aiming for is around a thousand dollars a month coming out of that list. Might be through one-off sales, might be through a subscription program that you're running, but that's pretty good kind of measure of whether or not you've got all the systems are working correctly or not. Okay. So once we know we're, we're generating that, maybe we've got this thousand dollars that's coming in now, it's not enough to live on, but what we can do is we can take that those 10 leads a week we're getting, and we might be able to do a little bit of promotion. So maybe we can run a, uh, an ad on YouTube, or maybe we can go and, and uh, ha pay somebody to do an email drop for us. So we can go find somebody who is in a, a similar niche as ours and say, hey, will you tell people about me and what I do? Maybe you can go on somebody's podcast and you can pay them to do an interview with you. There's nothing wrong with that, like anything to get exposure. And so you take that thousand dollars or that, let's just say half of it. So you take 50% of it and now you're taking $500 a month and you're putting it into advertising. And you take that 10 leads a week to 50 a week, right? And as long as we're, the email list is growing, okay? As long as this email list is growing and we go from 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000, guess what also happens? All we do is we're just measuring. Am I still getting that dollar per month per subscriber? If I am, 1,000 goes to 2,000, goes to 10,000, and so on and so forth. So you can see here that, oh, okay, if I want to make, if I'm holding to this, I would consider this to be conservative. Um, I've seen numbers here of everywhere between $1 and $4 per subscriber per month, okay? So $1 is really kind of at the, at the low end of what I think is reasonable, but let's assume it's at the low end. That means in order to make $10,000 a month, you need 10,000 subscribers. So now it's just a game, or not, you know, not $10,000, 10,000 subscribers, right? So now it's just a game. How do I get to 10,000? What do I have to do? What do I have to communicate? How do I have to, you know, adjust my marketing and my promotion? Where am I getting the best leads from? And then how am I using the money I have in the beginning to continue to build my audience? And once again, you get to a point where now, okay, I'm getting $10,000 a month. I'm making five or 10 grand a month. Well, now you can legitimately look at it and say, okay, well, what would happen if I was doing this full time? What if I didn't have the constraints of my full-time job and I just wanted to do this full-time? How do I, how, how can I make that transition? And everybody gets to, everybody who gets to that point reaches kind of that, that threshold where it's like, ha, ah, it's kind of risky, but I think I could do it if I just didn't have the other job. And at that point, you make the decision to either jump off and, and go into it full-time or not. And that doesn't always happen at the $10,000 a month range. It might happen at, at six or eight. It just depends on what you need. I had one client who only needed about $4,000 a month to pay his bills. Single guy, no attachments. Just, hey, man, if I make four grand a month, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like, I, I can get rid of all the other stuff that I'm doing. And so once he got the $4,000 a month, he went into it full time. And so the idea is you build the systems out, the three systems that you need, the lead engine, the conversion incubator, and your solution stack. And then you start small with your messaging and then you reinvest the money that you're making out of the business back into the business so that you can increase your reach and the number of people that, get, that start to know about you. But we don't start spending money on that until we have a system that we know works. Another big problem that I see is anybody who comes in with money. It's not everybody who starts a coaching business is broke. A lot of people come in, they're very successful. They're making several hundred thousand dollars a year doing what they do, especially if they're in sales or uh, some C-suite executive somewhere. Not uncommon for them to come in making a quarter million dollars a year, and now they want to get out of the rat, that rat race and start teaching people what they do, okay? The tendency for those people is to not want to have to wait. They want to pay to go faster which makes sense once you have your process in place, once you know you have a problem, you're solving a problem, the correct problem for people, and you know you've got your messaging right, and you've got your sequencing right, and all the stuff that goes into promotion, then we can put some capital behind that. If you do it in reverse, what ends up happening is you set a lot of money on fire. And I would 
caution you against trying to do any paid advertising until you already have a process in place that is generating you clients, um, even if it's a small amount, because that at least shows you that your process is working um, and that you might be able to increase conversions by just, or increase the number of sales that you're getting by promoting it to more people, okay? But that's it. That's the, the basic overview of how to structure and how to build a uh, six-figure year coaching business. Does anybody have any questions before I let you all go? No? Okay. Was this valuable? I mean, I've, I just wanted to try and find, because I had some questions about this, and I thought this might be good just as a primer on how to do it. Did you guys get some value out of this? Going once, going twice? I did. Cool. All right. Well, here's what I'm going to do. If you guys like this, if you guys would like help building your own coaching business, this is the one pitch I'll make to you. And uh, Jeff's already in this program, so you can hit him up if you want to know kind of what it's like being inside. Um, I have a program called The Collective. Um, it's a group of people who are all building their first coaching businesses. And um, I would love for you guys to come and join that if you're interested in getting some help building your business. If you want direct message me here on the platform on Telegram and I will send you a link to a Google Doc that explains everything. It's very low pressure. I will not hunt you down. I will not hound you. I don't do that. I will just give you the Google Doc and if you want to sign up and you want to become part of the program, then you can. I will also send you guys, I'll post this to the main chat, this Tools of the Trade, this document that I, uh, that I, I created for my collective members that kind of gives you some options on lighting and audio equipment, video equipment for creating, oh, sorry, for creating your coaching business. Um, I will drop this into the chat so you guys can access that as well. Um, if nobody's got any other questions, I will let you all go, but I appreciate you being here and being attentive and uh, you can direct, direct message me if you've got any, any questions that you just didn't want to bring up because you were too nervous in the group. Um, other than that, guys, be safe, be good. Talk to you soon.